Turn with me, please, in the scripture to the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. We have been discussing this year about the ministry with Christ, that he is the one who is the anointed one, and that our ministry, quote unquote, is in actuality an extension of his ministry. And so we've laid out some philosophy stones, if you would, some foundation stones. The love of Christ must be our core competency. The glorification of Christ must be our highest priority. And we must make the gospel of the ministry of Christ our sacred mission. In continuing this theme, we, we, we recognize that there is an inability on our part to do those things. To make the love of Christ our core, to glorify him as our priority, to make his gospel our sacred mission, we, there's a gap there between what can be done and what we can do and what needs to be done. The fact of the matter is you and I are not capable of doing supernatural things without a supernatural anointing. The Christian faith began as a supernatural revelation of God. We, we, our faith began with supernatural work. Our, our faith began with the miraculous, a virgin birth, a sinless life, an atoning, substitutionary, sacrificial death, a resurrection from the dead. These four principles of our faith, and of course there are others, but these are, are the things that we embody in the table of the Lord in which we're going to this morning. And we are reminded that the work of Christ is a supernatural one. And I'm always troubled by the fact that we tend to fall into, into uh, religious frameworks. And please, again, don't get me wrong on that. I'm not an anti-religionist. Religion has its place because it gives form and discipline and functionality that has, that has an important place. In the same way that, that your physical body gives functionality to your spirit, so too religion, for lack of a better term, the structures, the, the tenets of the faith, all of these things give functionality, but without the spirit, it's dead. A body without spirit is not alive. It's a corpse. The form is there, but the function is gone. The function comes from the animation and animation of the spirit. So too the ministry is this way. We have places in which we, you know, we, we gather on Sunday. That's, that's a form. Why do we gather on Sunday? I, 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 because because it's, it's the day the Lord rose. Others worship on Saturday, the, the, the Sabbath. There's a form to it. We in this house gather at 11 o'clock and then we gather on Friday nights at 7.30. Then we have other stuff. Those are forms and those are, are ways of, that, that we do things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But without the supernatural infusion of the spirit, it does not have life. So everything we do must have the witness of the spirit of Christ and the flow of his grace. The Lord Jesus Christ must anoint our efforts. He must enable us to do his work. In fact, he told the disciples very explicitly not to go do the work until they'd been endued with power. He was very specific in the first chapter of Acts. Don't go anywhere until you've received power. Stay in Jerusalem and tarry until you get power. Don't go into all the world until you receive the power. Don't go doing the ministry until you receive the power. Peter didn't get up and preach until he'd received the power. And, that, and this is the, the dynamic that has often been lost in modern Christianity. We want to go, and that's good. We want to do, and that's great. But if we go and do without the power of God, we are not going and doing anything of eternal consequence. We might feel better. We might see ourselves more nobly. We might consider ourselves to be better people. But you see, that's not the goal here. The goal is the transformation of human lives, and only God can do that. So Jesus said, but you will receive power. 
Say that with me. You will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, we must go. And as Costa de Air once said, when I receive the Holy Ghost, I receive the Holy Go. Once the Spirit animates your life, you cannot help but share his life with others. Because sharing Christ with others in the Spirit-filled dynamic is as natural as breathing to the child of God. You will receive power. And so these principles call us to to a, a basic mission statement, and that is that we exist to do the ministry of Christ, in the love of Christ, for the glory of Christ, and by the power of Christ. And so in John 20, the Lord outlines for his disciples his mission and sets it before them. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Everybody say that word with me. Peace. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace. Be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Would you please read verse 21 again together with me aloud? Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is the way that the ministry is to progress. Father sends the Son, the Son has sent the Spirit, the Spirit has empowered and enabled us, and the Son has sent us to do the Son's work. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The legitimacy of our faith is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is alive. The disciples were not overjoyed because they had a Holy Ghost goose bump. The disciples were not overjoyed because they'd sung a triumphant song. The disciples were not overjoyed because they'd heard a stirring sermon. The disciples were overjoyed because Jesus was in their midst. Flesh and blood alive. Not just a figment, not just a vision, not just a momentary, not just a, boy, that feels good. Did you feel that? No, the, they were overjoyed because Jesus was and is alive. It is this truth that is at the core of our faith. It is this truth that is at the core of this table. This is not a memorial to a dead guy. This is a memorial to someone who died and rose again. And so it is a, not a memorial as much as it is a living witness. This is where our legitimacy comes. And because Jesus lives, we have been called to, be the, the, to engage the world with the same motivation that he had. And that motivation is his love. Obviously, that's number two in our notes. Motivated by his love. Not motivated by fame. Not motivated by power. Not motivated by money. Not motivated so people will applaud us. Not motivated so we can feel better about ourselves. Not motivated so we could be the hero of our own story. But motivated by the love of God for humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Why did the father send the son? Because he loved us. Why do we engage in ministry? Because we love Christ and because we must love people. And when you feel that love for people kind of dying on the vine and you feel that kind of drenching up and you're just kind of tired of being around people and you're tired of doing your work and you're tired of going to church and you're tired of this and you're tired of that, go back to the well. Amen. 
It isn't their fault. You've been disconnected a little bit from the vine. The flow of grace isn't into your life as it needs to be. Personally, I know the evidence of when I'm too tired. The evidence of when I'm too tired is when I get irritated too easily. Two things have to be done. Get a little sleep. Maybe in my case, play a little golf. But I play it so poorly that that's not a good remedy anymore. <laughs> but go back to the well. Go spend some time with the Lord. Engage in worship. Tell him how much you love him and let him tell you how much he loves you. Visit the resurrected Christ. Be in the presence of the living Christ. Let him fill up your system again so that out of that overflow, you can minister grace and mercy into the lives of other people. So the legitimacy of our faith comes from his resurrection. Our motivation for ministry must be his love. This is the motivation of love that is incarnational and relational and therefore transformational. We must go. We must build bridges. We must engage. And then we create a conduit by which the Holy Spirit can transform other hearts and other lives. And this brings us to this, what we've been talking about this summer. And now that we're in October, I got to stop it. So here we are. Captivated by his peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The first words out of his mouth, the first word out of his mouth when he appears to the disciples is peace. Wherever the Lord is, there is peace. Wherever the Lord is, there is peace. You may have been hiding with doors locked for fear of what's out there. But if the Lord is in here, there is peace. And if the Lord sends you out there, there will be peace. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And wherever his presence is, there is peace. If you're walking in fear, if you're walking in stress, if you're walking in worry... If you're walking in anxiety, if you're walking in turmoil, then somehow, some way, you've kind of drifted from his presence. John Wimber used to say, I look at peace like a throw rug. I stand on it, and then I know I'm in the presence of God. And when I don't have peace, I start looking around for the peace. I start looking around for the Lord so that I stand there again and know I'm in the presence of the Lord. I don't need this to be right. I don't need that to be right. I don't need this over here to be right. The adversary could be fighting here. Circumstances could be de debilitating over there. That doesn't matter. As long as the Lord is with me, I will walk in peace. It's your inheritance. It's your inheritance, letter A in your notes. It's your inheritance. The Lord gave it to you. And because it's your inheritance, it's your responsibility. We've been talking about this for a while, and my heart's been very heavy with this. Peace is the responsibility and the overflow of a Christ-centered, trusting heart. We must walk in the ministry of the Prince of Peace. Jesus himself said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. Peace is in our DNA. Peace is something the Father has given to us. Peace is the overflow of our hearts. It has to be cultivated. It has to be tended. It has to be protected. Anxiety is like a weed. Peace is a fruit. Anxiety doesn't have to be tended to grow. It grows. Anxiety doesn't have to be cultivated to grow. It just shows up. Peace has to be cultivated a little bit because it bears fruit. It's not just for you as, a, as in a, a vine or a tree. It's for somebody else. So you have to cultivate it so you can bring it. 
You have to cultivate it so you can leave it. You have to cultivate it so you can give it. You have to cultivate it not only so you will be at peace, but that you will be a person of peace. This is your inheritance in Christ. This is the calling you've received. Paul told the Roman church, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Not as far as it depends on them. That's simple. That's the world's way of doing stuff. As far as it depends on you. And so the hour is growing late. The Lord's return. And and I know this, I'm going to say this and it sounds so cliche-ish because all of us who've been in the house of the Lord have probably heard this most of our life. But it is a truth. The return of the Lord is closer today than it has ever been. And it will be closer tomorrow. And I, and I don't want to go down a, a, a rabbit trail of eschatology. But beloved, you and I are living in the day where technologically, just technologically, all the prophecies that were written about could be fulfilled just through the, the, the mechanisms of technology. A system of currency. A system of governance a system of tracking, a system of finding. I went for years without getting a GPS in my car. You know why? I didn't want them to know where I was. People say, oh, you're silly. Do you know who created GPS? The military. GPS was not created so you could get to grandma's house. GPS was created so the bomb could get to your house. Now, that's the truth. That's the absolute truth. So I'm a little paranoid about things like that, okay? But when you stop and, and, and step back and you look at the revelation, you look at the prophecies, you look at scriptures that say, you know, basically there, there's a, a governing currency and there's a governing influence and no one can buy or sell without a mark and all of these things. Well, we are now, right now, for the first time really in human history at a technological state where not only can that happen, but psychologically people would will it to happen. Because of security. So I said that to remind you that the Lord's return is nearer now than ever. It could still be 500 years from now. I have no idea. And anyone that tells you they know when Jesus is coming back to the day and the hour is a liar. Okay? Just a flat out liar. They may be a delusional liar, but they're lying. Jesus himself said, No one knows the day or the hour. Not the angels in heaven, not even me. Only my Father knows the day or the hour. So if someone claims to know it, I would rather call them a liar than call Jesus a liar. So bear that in mind. But with that said, we are coming closer to the end. Here's my point in saying that. Let's say in God's heart, the end is here. And no one else knows exactly when it is. But I would suspect that the adversary of our soul can probably read some of the things going on in the world, and he's certainly stirring it up. And so as we get closer to the end, and let's say the end is here, there's a compression of things. There's a compression of intensity in the spirit realm. There's a compression of intensity even in nature. We see that again in, in, the, in the Revelation. We see that in the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 24. Talk about wars, rumors of wars, uh, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. So this, the, the fact that no one knows the day or the hour doesn't mean we can't tell the season or the signs. And so there's an intensity that's coming. Now, whether that is leading to the very end, I have no idea. It could be an intensity leading to a judgment that brings revival. It could be an intensity that leads to some other purposes of God that that I'm certainly unaware of. But here's the point I'm trying to make. The closer we get to the return of the Lord, the closer we get to the purposes of God being fulfilled in the earth, the more intense, not less intense, the more intense the struggle of faith becomes. Okay, 
So it is in that context that the Lord speaks to us about this particular ministry and why it is so hard, why it is so difficult, because there's an intensity in the age. There's an intensity in the atmosphere. There's a spirit of division that has been released in our land. A wickedness, a violation of, of even human dignity much less human rights, even human dignity that is taking place. And and, and the, the thing that causes me to pull out what little hair I have left, and that's an annoying thought, but nevertheless, is when the body of Christ, the possessors of grace, the house of the Lord, men and women of the word, Men and women of the Spirit of God. Men and women who have been given the treasure and the gift of peace and reconciliation. And we contribute not to grace but to division. Rather than being salt and light as darkness becomes more dark, we contribute to the dark. We take political sides. We take sociological sides. We want to come up with some silly argument about this and some no, uh, crazy notion about that. I'm telling you, by, by the authority of the word of God, you have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. Quit pawning that responsibility off on someone else. It is the church of Jesus Christ that must build bridges between ethnicities. It is the church of Jesus Christ that must build bridges between socioeconomic strata, as the world defines it. It is the church of Jesus Christ that must build bridges to the nations. It is the church of Jesus Christ that must look at each other as brother, as sister, and as friend. It is the church of Jesus Christ that must recognize that the ground at the foot of the cross is level ground. And there is only one to be held in high esteem. There's only one to be lifted up. There's only one to be glorified. And there's only one remedy. And it is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. What's that message look like? Luke 6, 27 and 28, Jesus says, I say to you who hear me and pay attention to my words, love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies. Make it a practice to do good to those who hate you. Bless and show kindness to those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Everybody say that last phrase with me. Pray. Pray. For those who mistreat you. This is what reconciliation looks like. I want want you to keep that thought, please, for just a few moments. We'll come back to it before we go to the Lord's table. Praying for those who mistreat us. And why that's such an important grace. But before I speak of that, I I just want you to bear that in mind. You and I have a deep responsibility here. A deep responsibility. You say, well, you know, pastor, it's just me. What what can I do? You don't understand. You don't understand how powerful the Holy Spirit is in you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, 
dwells in you. You say, well, I'm just, I'm just one guy. I'm just one woman. I'm just one, one teenager. I'm just one person. What can I do that has eternal consequences and eternal ramifications for the kingdom of God? I don't know. But I know 12 guys full of the Holy Spirit changed the world. I know that the psychologists tell us that the least among us have an influence over at least seven other people. And it doesn't take long to start figuring out geometrically that that's a broad influence. So one person can touch seven people, 100 people can touch 700 people, 1,000 people touch 7,000 people. It doesn't take long until you start seeing how an entire city, an entire community, an entire nation can be changed and influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit resident within a believer who believes. this to be true you and I are horribly limited I get that I got that I'm 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 more limited than I care to admit and getting more limited by the day it's kind of embarrassing but the fact of the matter is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and when one of us can put a thousand to flight and two of us ten thousand to flight in other words there is a flow of grace that can do more than we ever thought or dreamt possible but we have to take it seriously we have to believe these things Barnabas introduced Saul to the disciples. One guy. One guy. We have to be capable of being bearers of reconciliation, which means, as we talked about, and I won't go into it today for time's sake, but I've already already shared with you about this. We have to engage in the ministry the way the Lord does. What does the Lord do? The Lord is not bitter toward anyone. He's predisposed himself to forgive the whole world. The scriptures tell us that in 1 John 2, that that Christ is the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And so the little equation I left in your notes for you is that forgiveness plus agreement equals reconciliation. If my brother offends me, wounds me, harms me, I don't wait for him to say, I'm sorry, before I forgive him. Why in the world would you carry that burden so long? Why in the world would you carry that anger so long? Don't you understand? Forgiveness is the great remedy that God has given to you to not be bound by sin. We recognize this so readily when we sin. When we have transgressed against God, we can go to an altar, we can pray at our our home, we can ask God to forgive us, and we know and we sense that, that, that lifting of the burden off because we've sinned and we come into agreement, and so forgiveness is poured out, agreement is made, and we sense ourselves reconciled with God, the burden lifts, and it all goes away. We say, thank you, God. But yet when someone sins against us, we carry that thing. We hold on to it. And sin has no shelf life. Bitterness just grows and festers and tunnels deeper and deeper and deeper within a soul. Producing the weeds of mistrust, misunderstanding, anger, rage, hostility. And all of a sudden, people are hating other people, not for something that that other person did to them, but because someone who was like them did that to them 25 years ago. If sin has such a corrupting influence that we see what it looks like in our land gone unchecked, how much more does the Spirit of grace have a healing influence. If sin abounds, Paul said, how much more can grace abound? If sin has this depth of bitterness that can destroy a life, how much more does the blood of Jesus have a grace of hope that can transform a life? So when my brother offends me, 
Why hold on to that? Why? I, I need him to say he's sorry. No, you don't. You need him to say he's sorry or for some kind of agreement to take place for the two of you to reconcile. But you forgive him immediately. Don't carry that stuff. Don't hold on to that. Take it to the cross so you can be free. So you can be free. And here's the other part of it. By forgiving them before they say they're sorry, that's what allows you to reconcile when they do say they're sorry. How many of you have had this experience? Someone says they're sorry, or let's, let's put it the other way. You say you're sorry to somebody, and they haven't forgiven you yet. And so you go, to, you go to them and you say, Sister, I'm sorry for what I said, or I'm sorry for what I did. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know that this, or whatever. You say, I'm sorry. And, 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 they, and they look at you and, and they got this kind of phony because they're Christians probably and they know they're supposed to say okay. And so they, they say, oh, yeah, it's okay, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's all right. But in their mind, you know it's not all right. And all of a sudden then they say, yeah, you know... That really bothered me. And now, all of a sudden, because they haven't forgiven you before you said sorry, they can't forgive you when you say sorry. Are we, are we, are we talking here? So instead of there being reconciliation and agreement that comes out of that, what ends up happening is a new fight starts. A new argument begins. Okay, maybe this is too, too philosophical for you. Okay, husband and wife. If you don't have to forgive every day, you're probably not married. Little irritations, little, you know, this and that and the other. The fact of the matter is, the more deeply close and personal a relationship is, the more you have to practice this truth. Little things left unchecked suddenly grow. Why? Because that's the way weeds are and sin is a weed. It grows quickly. So if, so, so a person that is close, they have a relationship, they're talking, they're conversing, there's, there's anger because something was left undone, or maybe the sin was deeper, I don't, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, unless you can forgive before they say they're sorry, you're going to have a hard time forgiving when they say they're sorry. Forgiveness precedes reconciliation. The problem for most of us is we have said forgiveness is reconciliation. No, it's not. Forgiveness is the step on the road. Can you imagine you coming to Christ and saying, Lord, I'm really sorry, and the Lord looking at you and going, yeah, okay. But you know what? This, 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 and having him respond to you in bitterness... Anger? The reason the Lord can reconcile with you so quickly when you agree and confess, and yeah, he'll expose all that stuff, and the reason he exposes all that stuff is so you get rid of it. But it's quick and it's full and it's total because he's already given his life for you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Why would you hold on to this stuff? So here it goes. Paul told the Roman church in Romans 10, 15, how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. My friends, reconciliation is the heart of the gospel. It is the message of his gospel. It is the heart of the Lord. 
Reconciliation within the body of Christ precedes reconciliation within the community. Just as reconciliation is the product of forgiveness and agreement, so the ministry of the gospel, listen to me very carefully, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build a framework for your understanding. Just as reconciliation is the byproduct or the product, rather, of forgiveness and agreement produces reconciliation on the interpersonal level, okay? So, too, reconciliation within the house of the Lord is what creates the atmosphere for us to reach into our community and bring evangelism and reconciliation there. See, if the house of the Lord is not at peace, what are you bringing out of here? What are you taking with you? And let me just be more blunt. If the house of the Lord isn't at peace, what are you going to, who, what are you going to bring into it? Would the Lord trust babies with people who are operating in neglect? Rick Warren one time said, the, the Lord is looking for warm incubators to place baby Christians in. If the house of the Lord is not reconciled, if, if we can't sit next to a person because of their skin color, what in the world are we offering the world? If we can't sit next to a person because of their political persuasion, what in the world are we offering the world? If we can't sit next to each other because of our age, let me be a little more blunt. If we can't sit in worship because that song's too young or this song's too old, What are we offering the world? If we can't be in the same house of worship because one's wearing a tie and another one's wearing a golf shirt, what are we offering the world? You see, this is my point. These little things left undealt with, they, 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 they're weeds. Reconciliation within the body precedes reconciliation within the community. We want Fruitvale to enter the house of the Lord and see it look different. That it looks whole. That it looks healthy. That it looks alive. That it looks vibrant. That it looks rich. And it looks like something they don't have out there. That young and old can sit together and worship. That rich and poor can sit in the same house and worship. That it matters not what the skin color is or the ethnicity or the background or the, or the, or the bank account. None of that stuff matters. That there's a wholeness in the house of the Lord. That there's a peace here that yeah. passes understanding. That they can walk into the sanctuary and have it be a sanctuary. And, oh, this is different. I don't know what it is, but it's different. Yeah. And I can promise you. And I can say this to you because it's not something that I've created or in any way, shape, form, or fashion long before I got here. But I can promise you this. I have, and, and I'm making no exaggeration. I've been here 11 years. It is easy to say that at least 10 times a year. So over 100 times since I have been here. Strangers have walked on this campus, met me in my office, and talked about, with me over business and things like that. And at least 10 times a year, strangers walking on our campus say these words. This is an oasis. I don't know what it is, but there's peace all around this place. And I just smile and say, thank you, Lord, for that prayer meeting that goes on every night. 
Thank you, Lord, for the saints that pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Because, yes, this is an oasis in the heart of Oakland. This is a place of peace. And everyone who's ever walked on our campus tells us that. From WASC committees, secular agencies who come to check our accreditation, to other business people and other, other folks from all different walks of life, there's a peace here. And what I'm just saying to you is, let that peace that is here go out from here. Well, you say, well, pastor, I can't take you with me. That wouldn't bring the peace. I'd probably annoy too many people. The Holy Spirit goes with you. Reconciliation within the body precedes reconciliation within the community. And this brings us to where I want to end today and begin next Sunday. Peace is our inheritance. It is our responsibility. And it must become our legacy. must become our legacy. If you don't think legacy matters, you haven't been paying attention to things. There are very old wounds in this nation that have not been dealt with correctly by the church. They can't be dealt with by politicians. So don't be shocked when they can't do something. They can't do it. There are very old wounds within this nation and within this world that the longer they go, the more corrupting they become. And the church has to not only walk in because we've received this as our inheritance and it's our responsibility, but we have to determine in our mind, we want to leave this for the next generation. It's not enough that I have peace, I want my children to have peace. It's not enough that I live in peace, I want my grandchildren to live in peace. It's not enough that I preach peace. I want them, who I may never meet, but my great-grandchildren, I want them to know peace. That I've created a highway by God's grace. That we've created a, a methodology by the Spirit's leading and by the Word's direction. That we can leave something. Because you see, it's a real danger now. We're almost at a tipping point. We're almost at a tipping point. I'm 55 years old. So I'm old enough to sound like an old guy. Here's how old guys talk. I remember... And everybody under 30 rolls their eyes, oh, no. Oh. Nostalgia is the great, people want to know what nostalgia is. Nostalgia is memory with filters. It's not quite as good as you remembered it. Okay? May not be as bad either. I don't know. But it's not quite as good. I don't know. With that as said, the intensity, now I'm going to make a point I'm trying to make. The intensity of that evil that I talked about previously I do remember when it wasn't quite so intense. And that's unfiltered. That's not nostalgia. I'm not saying things were better then because they aren't. And sin has been with us since Adam and Eve in the garden. But the intensity of it, 
the celebration of it, the glorification of it, the honoring of sin and the disparaging of righteousness, this has become more and more intense. And with it, I mean, it's the natural consequence. Where sin, where sin, where sin is allowed a, a degree of honor, what, the, the evidence of it, the fruit of sin, is always division, it's always violence, it's always hatred, it's always anger, it's always rage, it's always wickedness, it's always lust and envy and covetousness. All of, now, now think about the things I just listed. Can go under one category, not peace. If I'm coveting something, my neighbor, if I'm envying something about my brother, if I'm raging over this, if I'm angry over that, guess what that is? Not peace. So if I want to leave a legacy of peace, I look back and I think, if, if, it's, if it's digressed to where I am right now, left unchecked, I'm very serious. Listen to me carefully. If you don't get anything else today, listen to me. If it's as grotesquely violent, destructive, and demonic as it is right now, left unchecked, what will our children inherit? What will our grandchildren inherit? You see... We have to arrest this now. We have to arrest this now. We have to arrest this now. Inheritance is what we receive. Inheritance is what we receive. Responsibility is what we do. Legacy is what we leave. When I can't receive anything else and I can't do any more, what am I leaving? When I can't receive anything else and I can't do anything more, what am I leaving? What are you leaving? What are we leaving? Pray for those who mistreat you. Why? I'm going to talk about it more next Sunday, but one of the reasons is this. Because if you don't, who will? If you don't, who will? Remember the, the issue. This is unfettered, unchecked wickedness that is compounding and now compressing. If you don't pray for the wicked, if you don't pray for the lost, if you don't pray for the enemies of the cross, if you don't pray for your enemies, who will? It will continue unchecked. Your prayers are checking that evil. It is your prayers that raise the standard against the wickedness of the age. I'm always amazed, and I've been pastoring 36 years now, I'm always amazed at some people who will not pray for whoever happens to be president at the time, because they don't like the person. That's about as wrong thinking as I can imagine. If the president is doing error, that's all the more reason to pray. Well, I don't, I don't want him or her to be blessed. Well, that's your own thing. I need evil checked. Pray. Well, they, these people over here are trying to put their agenda on the church. I'm not praying for them. What? Those who are trying to assault us, and they're out there, trust me. All the more reason to pray for them. 
Because I need that wickedness checked. That gangbanger on the corner, I ain't praying for him. What? All the more reason you need that evil to be checked. You need the Spirit of God to touch that young life. You need the Holy Ghost to convict that young man. You need the love of Christ to reach that young person, to reach that president, to reach that congressman, to reach that governor, to reach that mayor, to reach that person who insulted you and violated you and was harmful to you. We need evil to be checked. We must obey Jesus Christ and pray for those who mistreat us. If we don't, who will? And if we don't, what will we leave? What will we leave? Inheritance is what we receive. Responsibility is what we do. Legacy is what we leave. We'll develop this more next week, but Let us ask the Lord to help us as we go to his table, a table of peace, a table of reconciliation, a table of forgiveness, a table of praying for those who mistreat. Christ hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. The Roman soldier So just another criminal to him. Except the way the man died. Truly, this is the Son of God. Many of the scribes and Pharisees, this was a blasphemer or a threat to their position. But many of them got saved after he rose. Why? I thoroughly believe it's because he prayed. He prayed. Peter, before his failure, Jesus predicted his failure and said, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Pray for those who mistreat you because we have to check wickedness. Being salt and light isn't just me being good or you being good. It's us taking on the wickedness of this age and taking it to the Lord. Checking it. You have that ability because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, beloved, this is, this is, this is what Christianity actually looks like. Sitting in a chair, singing a song, Worshiping Jesus in a beautiful sanctuary is nice. Christianity actually has to live out there. It has to live out there. Would you prepare your hearts to go to the Lord's table? Communion team and worship team, would you please come and take your places? Please